talk about the semantic web uh, if you're new to this subject. And to do so, I'm going to have to give you a brief history on information, and in particular how information is connected. So if we go back before the internet, before the World Wide Web, what you have is scientists and individuals writing long freeform documents that had references to other documents, and those references were in the form of citations. Now as a consumer of one of these documents, what you would have to do is read the citation and then send out via mail for a copy of the document, or you'd have to go to your library. And this was really tedious. So from the point of view of the consumer, what you really had was a world where there was tons of documents all over the place, some accessible to you, some not accessible to you. But that burden was on you in order to follow the citations. Now, the web, the great invention, was the hyperlink. So if I'm reading a document that has a hyperlink, I can just click on that link and boom, I get the next document in the chain of documents, right? I can go right to the source of the reference. Now this, as a consumer, is amazing, right? It saves a ton of time. However, from a technical perspective, there was a lot of things that had to happen. And I'm going to go through that history in order to uh, enable you to really appreciate um, what the semantic web brings to the table on top of this. So if we go back to the hyperlink and then we say, okay, Tons of documents are on the internet. They're all linked to each other via hyperlinks. What does that look like? Well, it looks kind of like this diagram. You've got a bunch of documents and there's arrows between the documents. Um, underneath, in order to make that happen, what you've got is a bunch of computers and the documents are sitting on the computer. So for example, technically speaking, this document that I'm reading is sitting on this computer over here. And what the hyperlink does is it basically says, there's another document on some other system somewhere that has this information. Um, so before the web and and when the internet was very new, all of these connections had to be done by hand. It was extremely tedious. You had to say, well, this other server is residing on this other network, and you've got it, and here are the user credentials to the other network, and blah, 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 blah. But eventually, you could actually link these things up. The great invention of the internet early on um, was that the internet cloud sort of abstracted that whole connectivity process away from you so that instead of having to worry about where the other document is physically residing you can just give it a, a little address and you've got a hyperlink and that's the way that everything connects so the great advantage of web 1.0 is that even though you might have tons of different servers in this diagram, you don't have to think about them as being servers. You could just think about them as being documents. You don't care about the servers. So the real advantage is that the whole mechanism, the whole network structure, the physical layer is abstracted away so that you don't have to think about it. Um, and I want you to keep that in mind as, as we go forward and talk about the semantic web and, and how it goes even beyond this. But before that, We'll talk about Web 2.0. So Web 1.0 was documents. Web 2.0 is applications. You had LinkedIn and MySpace and Yelp and Gmail and all those things that you interact with today. And they go beyond um, just the data that you're storing on the computers. Now, the big drawback to these systems is that they don't interoperate. You know, So if you ever update your profile on LinkedIn, you get a new job or something like that. Facebook does not automatically know about it. In fact, you've got to double enter. You've got to go to LinkedIn, you've got to enter the data, then you've got to go to Facebook, and then you've got to go to the um, section in Facebook where you enter your employment information, and you've got to enter it there, and probably other places as well, right? Because they don't share information. The data is not connected to each other, even though you might have a link here and there between the systems. Now, companies have this very same problem, right? You've got different databases, your financial system, your actuarial system, your HR system, within companies that don't really connect to each other, right? The data is stored in one system and you've got double entry problems um, and it's expensive to do to, to connect these things up in any reasonable way. So the whole idea of Web 3.0 is to connect the data, not just the documents, not just high level links between applications, but to connect the data at a lower level so that an employment information, to go back to the LinkedIn example, stored on LinkedIn would be shareable and connectable in a way uh, in Facebook that it's not today. So to break that down, if we look at back our Web 1.0 um, and Web 2.0 document silos and data silos, you get the systems, Facebook and LinkedIn, and maybe you get something like New York Times. Um, and today, information about Evan Sandhouse, who's a prominent semantic web practitioner, will be stored three different times in three different ways and possibly conflicting on all of those systems information like such as his name, his address, 
publications that he's written, conferences that he's spoken on, stuff like that. So what we want to do is get beyond just the document. We want to get to the data level so that specific data elements can be referenced between documents so that there's maybe one source of key Evan Sandhaus data and Facebook can just reference it. And if the data is updated, then Facebook automatically knows that the data is updated. So the idea is that instead of having URLs between documents, you get URLs between facts, right? And it's at a lower level than just the document, at a lower level than just the application. And in doing so, the great advantage is that you no longer have to think about specific documents. You just have to think about data and information. Now, this is extremely powerful, right? Um, in the same way that Web 1.0 enabled you to not have to think about where the information was sitting. You didn't have to think about the network layer and the machine layer and all this sort of stuff. The semantic web enables you to not have to think about specific document locations. All it has, all, all it asks you to do is to connect basic information up. And once you do that, the whole world, from a data perspective, makes a lot more sense and can be kept a lot more organized. So that's the basic idea of the semantic web: is that it represents information at a lower level than documents, little facts, and it connects them up. Special thanks goes out to Sir Tim Berners Lee, the creator of the World Wide Web for the uh, all the images that were used in this presentation.